Unturned has had many great maps over the years through this game's development cycle. From st humbly starting with Canada, which sadly got scrapped, going to PEI, Yukon, Washington, Russia, and then a bunch of curated maps after that. There are a lot of great maps that Unturned has that are still being played to this day. But in my opinion, one map stands above the rest. And that is Elver. In my opinion, Elver is the greatest Unturned map of all time. When it comes to Unturned's official and curated maps, a lot of them fi follow the same repetitive cycle. You spawn in, you, get, you loot until you get some decent clothes, meds, food, and uh, of course, decent weapons. And then you just PvP, build your base, and then you just PvP until you're the strongest player on your server. But then what? After that, there's really not much to do in Unturned. Now, Russia, Hawaii, Greece, and a few other maps are notable maps who have kind of overcome this barrier of endgame unturned by adding quest lines and easter eggs. These quests, they help extend the endgame of unturned before the average player gets bored and quits the server. Elver also does this quest line stuff, but on a level far superior to any other map in Unturned. So what exactly makes Elver so great? So to discuss this, we're gonna have to break down Unturned maps in a few different sections. Elver's progression is by far the most unique progression there is in Unturned. You start off by looking for powerful guns and clothes of course, but you also need to start hunting for crafting materials that are required to make the sacrificial scripture. This involves a lot of the most expensive materials all over the map. For example, the green crystal and the graphics card, both of which can only be found in the mall, the biggest and most and the highest traffic area in all of Elver. This means that the player will likely end up doing a lot of pvp on your average server and it's fairly common for a lot of people to just set up their bases before they even get to the safe zone and also one of the most genius ideas is essentially locking the most powerful items behind the safe zone and this leads to in my opinion more skill based pvp combat in the early game as a lot of these players have to rely on the le less powerful guns that deal less damage but these guns obviously are very serviceable still like the pog for example the pog is still is it's the workhorse gun of elver but i think i could get the guns a little bit soon once you reach the safe zone however it opens up a lot of the most powerful items and you can buy all these items through NAS, which is a currency you can acquire from completing quests or just selling items. This is where the priority of the player shifts from the scripture grind since it's complete, completed to doing quests, buying the strongest weapons and armor. And now your priority is to try and get access to the dead zone by crafting a gas mask or as it's called in Elver, the respirator mask. Throughout this whole process, of course, even if you're getting the gas mask and stuff, getting components and graphics cards will still be one of your highest priorities throughout the entire playthrough. I've seen myself go on countless looting runs to find component parts to still make components because, and also countless looting runs to get green crystals and graphics cards because they also just play a pivotal role in the mid to late game parts of uh, Elver as well.
Ever's unique guns and simplified ammo system have made gunplay much more fun and skill focused and also made it so more guns can be essentially used and the meta is much more diverse compared to vanilla unturned and also compared to the vanilla guns the ever pvp guns even the best ones have lower fire rate less damage and significantly more recoil compared to the regular vanilla guns not to mention the attachments for the elver guns aren't as good as the vanilla guns for example a elver vertical grip reduces the spread by 10 percent and also reduces the recoil by 10 percent if you compare this to a vanilla unturned vertical grip which reduces the recoil vertical recoil by 60 to 80 percent you can kind of see how overpowered grips are in vanilla unturned compared to the elver ones the elver ones are designed to help reduce your recoil slightly but the vanilla guns are designed to turn your gun into a laser beam essentially and also vanilla guns the higher time to kill nature of the elver guns make it easier to react to when you're shot at basically what i mean is that when you're getting sprayed down you can there's more chance for you to react and get to cover and then have a nice skill based gunfight instead of just getting lasered by a maple strike and not being able to do anything because you are basically just caught with your pants down and you couldn't get to your cover fast enough and also in vanilla unturned a lot of snipers don't really get used and this is mostly because their ammo spawns are hot garbage and the repair costs are stupid they're just very high and also they break insanely fast for example the grizzly the grizzly breaks in around 25 shots it takes an average of 25 shots for a grizzly to reach zero percent durability and that just isn't fun it isn't fun to only take a few to like shoot an entire grizzly magazine or maybe two to be fair to it and then you have to repair it otherwise you're gonna start losing damage it's not really fair and it's not really fun because everybody knows how hard it is to get a grizzly and you also have to basically you you can't really use it and it's a lot to maintain and so with elver snipers having a lot of durability I think the meta of Elver is much more diverse. You can actually see people using snipers because the snipers have very easy to find ammo and also they have very good durability. But that in general applies to every single Elver gun. Durability isn't really a factor on Elver because the guns just last for such a long time before they need to, repair, to be repaired. And also the stock attachment system is also a much better way in my opinion to handle the tacticals although it's not really tacticals instead of adaptive chambering or rangefinder being the meta because that that reinforces the idea of lower time to kill which means less time to run to cover and stuff like that so in my opinion i think the stocks are a great addition to unturned and specifically for elver Most of Elver's locations are, simply put, useful. You have an incentive to go to these locations for one reason or another. Obviously, some locations are better than others. For example, mall is definitely superior to hospital. But there is still an incentive to go to the hospital because you can find a defibrillator battery. And also, they have quote response. And a lot of these locations have a, have a, at least one cultist spawn, for example, like the fire station. But if we're talking about a location that I feel like is truly useful, I would say Fisherman's Grove and Park. 
there is no reason to go to Fisherman's Grove unless you're looking for the, for a blue key card, and there's no reason to go to the park unless you're about to tear down the most wanted poster. There's just no reason to go to these locations aside from that. And uh, one thing I love is that the maps, the location is pretty, the locations are pretty evenly distributed in terms of loot. I mean, obviously, Mall is undoubtedly the best one, but there is a lot of chances you can find a decent gun by just camping at a certain location and just farming it, you know, maybe a less contested location. But by far, the best location of this whole map is the dead zone. Goodness! If that didn't act, then show you why this is the greatest dead zone in Hunter in history. I really don't know what else to say. A good amount of your playthrough is literally preparing for this very moment. To enter the dead zone. To access the best loot this map has to offer. And a lot of it. The barrier of entry is the highest out of any dead zone I've ever seen but it is well worth it. Unlike other dead zones in Unturned, like Russia, Greece, and Hawaii for example, sometimes you can leave those locations and not be satisfied with the loot you've gotten. You'll be like, damn, this dead zone run was garbage, bro. I really risked all these filters for this, really? Not even a good gun, not even like a grizzly at least. But Elvra on the other hand, if you get access to the gun room, you're guaranteed to get the strongest assault rifle and the strongest sniper on the map. That's a guarantee, unless someone is kind of in there with you, but that very rarely happens. So, the Elver Desmond has never ever left me disappointed after I finished shooting it. It had such great loot. And... Honestly, I wouldn't even recommend looting the middle part where, you know, the barrier of entry is low, you know, no key cards. I will loot all the locations that acquire a key card to en enter because that middle part compared to the other ones is just garbage. The amount of loot you can get from looting all the rooms is immense and it's by far the most satisfying dead zone ever. And also one of the biggest, uh, biggest pluses is how they nailed the sound and just ambient sounds of the dead zone every other dead zone except silo 22 on russia which did it to a very weak extent never had the ambient sound never changed you don't feel any extra risk like the environment just you know you don't feel the extra danger you're putting us to yourself in because if you die in the dead zone you're screwed that's that's something that people just never realize but ever the radios the zombies for some reason all of it you just feel the extra tension in the desert and honestly that that really makes you feel the risk as well and in my opinion that's what really puts the elver dead zone above the other ones the other ones are good russia is good but Compared to the Elver Dead Zone, they just straight up just they Elver's in a whole nother league compared to any other dead zone put in unturned. Speaking of ambient sound and environment, for a medium-sized map, Danaby and Renexon have really used up every single square meter of the map to its fullest potential. The idea of making the city a non-billable area, which means people can't just block off loot spawns, is genius. Also making a place exclusively for horror beacons, also genius. You see, a lot of people don't even go to Ghost Valley, and that kind of makes horror beacons relatively safe. 
Also, this is the only medium sized map that feels much bigger than it actually is. I'm not, I don't want to say it feels large, but it feels close to a large map, even though it's just a medium sized map. Maybe it's because of the forest or on the outskirts of the town. I don't really know. But one of the best aspects of this map is the full moon. Just like the dead zone, you can feel the tension and risk rise because the zombies are now stronger. Not to mention the amazing sirens, the cars, the cars just beeping. Also, one thing I forgot to mention is that all the cars you can extract fuel from, which is, in my opinion, a much more realistic way in a zombie apocalypse to get fuel from, which is from those crash cars. I think that was a genius idea and a very good use of the fuel reserve system in Unturned and yeah again no other vanilla or curator map have treated full moon the way in my opinion it should be treated where you feel the power rising from the zombies the base building in Elver carries over a lot of aspects from vanilla vanilla unturned with a few key changes for example a few new build buildables like triangular pine uh, triangular roof holes uh, which is a very welcome change for people who make triangular bases also a high capacity thick crate which is a great place to store all your non-essential items and also new crystallized buildables which I think are very nice way to fortify your base to prevent raiding. It's a great way to set up a vault room with. It's a great tool. And also it is very expensive, which keeps it from being too overpowered. But one, th one of the biggest additions for making bases harder to raid are the Devastator Sentry Guns. These Sentry Guns are the first true sentry guns in Unturned. When sentries were first added, they were intended to serve as a offline method to defend your base. However, these sentries have been far too easy to take out in regular Unturned and poses very little challenge unless it's a loaded shotgun at very close range. But even then, any clever raider could just place a bed down, especially if there's nobody around, they can just place a bed now, down and die repeatedly to the sentry until the sentries are of ammo. So main because of this ammo maintenance, it also makes sentries ineffective. However, the Devastator is a gun that deals a lot of damage and has infinite ammo. And to keep players from like running around and shooting with it, you can't equip the sentry or the Devastator as a main weapon. And the very high damage in combination to the vet to the pretty high range too deals is, is a real challenge if raiders try to attack your base. They really have to be wary of the devastator and probably have to tank a shot or two if they want to try and take it out. Another addition is making the top tier doors require a computer chip, which is a very expensive part to get. And that's another aspect that keeps bases from be becoming too overpowered. But the best part is just streamlining the base building process. This happened with almost all the crafting. But a very smart idea to just make the metal parts take 10 scrap instead of 5 sheets. Which take up way more space. And is overall just less practical. Because all you have to do now is just get 10 scrap and then you can make whatever metal structure you want. And that streamlining is honestly something Unturned should have done a long time ago. But I'm very happy that Danaby and the Renexon decided to do that. One thing that I almost forgot to talk about while, while writing this script is 
the vehicles. Ever since Nelson added the ability to customize physics, vehicle physics, Danaby was able to increase the handling and maneuverability of vehicles on the off-road to insane, uh, insane levels. The vehicle physics feel amazing in Elver. And on turn, you hit the slightest bump and your car is just doing this weird up and down, down thing for a little while and it just can compromises your ability to turn the car. And off-roading most of the time is just off limits. What's the point? You're just gonna have a miserable experience if you off-road in regular on turn. But Danaby experimented and customized and worked with the vehicle physics for a while. And it made such a just a it's just so awesome man i'm so i'm so used to garbage physics when i play on turn that i was i was hyped i was hyped to see good vehicle physics like on turn players have been through on turn players have been down bad when it comes to vehicle physics bro i'm even capping also another welcome addition is if the car is not purple or pink rarity you can't lock it that's amazing because how many times have you seen a abandoned common car in regular vanilla unturned? You come up to it and it's locked. Like, what you gonna do? You you're just gonna stare at it and you're gonna be like, damn, it's locked. I can't do anything. Ima and imagine if that player like logged off and never came back on the server. So, honestly, that addition kind of is is just amazing. I don't know how I can put it into words, but it's amazing. And also, if you want to steal one of the old rare or legendary vehicles, you can craft a steel wheelie for the steep price of 8 magenta crystals. Or you can also find it in the dead zone, in the room where you can find the 60 round max and 20 round sniper max. I don't remember which color it was. I think it was black. Uh, I'm not sure. But you can also find it there, but you can also craft it. And I think making a very high cost craftable steely wheelie is a great idea. Because looking for looking for items a lot of the time is just really a drag and being able to craft a lot of high tier items is just a very good addition made by Danaby and the Nexon in general. Elvers, when it first launched, was initially a bit unbalanced. There were a lot of teleporters. You needed to sacrifice a horde beacon to gain access to the safe zone. And some locations, like dorms, was completely useless back in the day when it came, first came out. I personally had the privilege of playing with Danaby 2 and the Nexon and his crew. Thanks, somebody on Earth. And we played on a vanilla server when it was first released. And after playing a bunch of, after doing a bunch of PvP, Danaby realized that some aspects of the map were simply overpowered. A lot of people, when you, when they kill you in mod, they would take your stuff and run towards the mod teleporter and teleport away with your loot, and you can't do anything about it. Not to mention, the floating island was ve much higher up than than it is now, and it was in the middle of the map because it was on top of mod. That made it so some people can just use binoculars. In a, in a squad, they use binoculars and they call out positions of where enemies are and they can just, you know, go to town and get a bunch of kills and just dominate the server. And also, another style a lot of teams ran, and it happened to us, is that they would parachute off using the broken version of the military parachute, which reduced falling speed by like 95 percent or something completely ridiculous like that where you can literally just glide across the whole map it was completely broken not to mention there was a glitch or a exploit i should say that players could exploit to get an infinite money supply i've never seen the glitch in action but it was quickly patched by the enemy so over the coming weeks after launch most of the teleport the teleportations were removed the floating island was lowered and moved to where the farm is and the fall speed the fall speed reduction of parachutes and balloons were reduced to be a bit more balanced so you can't glide all the way across the map 
and also doors became useful with their unique rooms and keys that you needed to open them and of course the quest line and the easter egg oh my god the easter egg we're finished The quest line at first is quite grindy. Most of the quests that you receive from the main NPC, which is Rainride, involves hunting key cards, which is relatively easy, hunting wand imposters, which is also relatively easy. But then the other quests are more passive, as in you can just do that with your regular playthrough. But it is quite grindy. For example, you have to kill a total of 1,500 zombies across all three parts of the Zombie Huntsman quest. You have to do a total of six horde beacons across the three horde beacon quests. And the horde beacons are by far the most grindy part since you need to hunt down at least six graphics cards. And that means that you're gonna be in mall or in the dead zone, which is probably the better idea, in the dead zone hunting for graphics cards. And you keep making these horde beacons and placing them in ghost valley to do the horde beacons the best way to do the horde beacons in ghost valley if you don't want to waste a lot of ammo and just want a more stress-free experience is to just put a few of those devastator sentries down although they are hard to find and hard to craft and also very hard to transport because of the space they take it is by far the best way to do the horde beacons if you if you're looking at the background for this right now almost all of my horde beacons I just put the sentries down and just shot at the acid spirit zombies and the mega zombie. That's all I did. You would, it was easy mode. And also, when you do all six horde beacons, you'll kill a total of six times 132, which is 792 zombies, which is more than half of the 1,500 zombies you need to kill to finish all the huntsman quests. And there's also another quest line from an NPC called Matt. If I'm not mistaken, it's the dude with the detonator on the left side of Rainwright. And it involves farming, fishing, and plant requests. Which are much easier to do and less grindy. Aside from fishing quests. And you can get some very nice loot. For example, the fishing rod. And after finishing all of these quests, both of Matt and Rainwright's quests. You get access to Washington. And now Washington involves a bit of parkour and navigating around a very close part. You navigate through the heart of Seattle where the crane is in Washington. And you can also find guns that only spawn in Washington in Elver. We're talking about Elver versions of the Eagle Fire, Elver versions of the Hawkhound, and Elver versions of the Cobra. Uh, the Eagle Fire is definitely a top tier capable gun if you know how to use it correctly i don't know about the hawk hound i think i think the rebel is just the best out of all of them and i i, I haven't used the cobra so i can't tell you how it sits in the elver meta at all but in washington you look around for these keys to open doors and the first two are very easy to find and the last one is right on nelson's counter who is all the way at the top of the apartment you grab this key to open the little shed inside Seattle or uh, inside the crane, I think, to rescue Big J. And after freeing Big J, he goes back to the safe zone island and he gives you the final quest line, which is known as Punisher. The first part involves going to the dead zone, which for probably what is your last time in your uh, regular play playthrough. And going inside the restricted area to get the blueprint for the Sword of Light. And after you're done with that, you craft the Sword of Light with a cyan crystal, the energized staff, which is simply a staff plus a green crystal. And a golden swordfish, which is simply a swordfish and a magenta crystal. And you make the Sword of Light. Now, the Sword of Light is by far the best looking melee weapon I've ever seen. It is very cool looking. And I really love that 
dematerializing effect that it has. It's honestly one of the best quest rewards I've ever seen because it's just a very sexy looking gun. It's a very, I mean, not gun, sword. It's, it's, it's just look at this, man. Like, you can't tell me this doesn't look amazing. And after that, you begin part two of the Punisher quest, which is simply being able to rename your sword. It's really nothing else aside from that. You can choose to keep the Sword of Light name, or you can choose from a multitude of names that are given to you. I personally chose Staff Mark II because I used the staff for my basically my entire playthrough. And then you, and then the real stuff starts. 